So, <clears throat> my name is Howie Rosen, and I'm a member of the MIT Club of Northern California Board of Directors. And I just want to say a word or two about why we're all here. And <clears throat> this has uh, been organized by the Life Science Forum of the MIT Club. And uh, they've been having the With Insight series in Cambridge at the Koch Institute. And makes sense since that's where the Institute is. <clears throat> and as I learned more about the Koch and about the series, uh, it just seemed like it'd be great to be able to share all the energy and excitement with people who uh, aren't regularly in the Cambridge area. And so um, over the past year, we've been working with Koch to bring this to the West Coast. And um, so this is the first uh, outside of Cambridge of the With Insight series. And it is a series. Um, and so we hope that um, if we get good feedback from this evening's event, that we will bring the other speakers from the Koch Institute um, to share their thoughts with us as well. And then have the local speakers who provide the clinical need and the business context for what's going on at the Koch. So I'd like to introduce Fred Middleton, who's uh, graciously offered to be our moderator. And um, you see Fred's background in the, in the program. Um, besides being an MIT alum, uh, um, Fred is really one of the pioneers of the biotech community, not just here in the Bay Area, but really everywhere, um, given the role that Genentech um, has played. And so we're very fortunate to have Fred um, agree to help us out tonight. So thank you. Thank, thanks, Howie. I uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And in, in my current role, uh, I serve on the, the leadership advisory board to the Koch Institute, which is uh, uh, it's a volunteer group, uh, largely of alumni and uh, people interested in cancer research. And so, I, you know, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce, you know, the Insight Lecture Series here on the behalf of the Koch Institute. Um, you know, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with uh, what, who or, or what the Koch Institute is, um, it's a newly, let's see if I'm going the right direction here, it's basically Oops, sorry, wrong button. Here we go. Here we can. He's going to fix me, fix it up. I'm, I've <laughs> never been too good with slide projectors. The Koch Institute uh, came online approximately uh, two years ago. Uh, it's named after uh, David Koch, who was the benefactor. David is, is an alumni of MIT uh, and also a cancer survivor himself uh, who's very passionate about uh, cancer research. And um, it's a $350 million investment. Uh, to consolidate all of MIT's uh, research activities in the areas of cancer. Uh, they have department members from uh, the Department of Biology, but also from many of the engineering departments of MIT. Uh, there are approximately uh, 24 uh, faculty and complete you know, lab operations um, at the Koch. Um, and uh, it, it's really an amazing facility. I urge you to uh, visit it if you're back in Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge has become um, probably the leading center in terms of growth in uh, cancer research. There are many major uh, companies locating research facilities from around the world um, there now. Um, one of the principal goals of the, of the Koch is to focus on patient needs and the uh, development of new technologies and the transfer of those technologies to be able to help patients. You know, as you know, MIT does not have a medical school, but they have many collaborations with major hospitals um, and clinicians you know, throughout uh, Cambridge and throughout the Boston area. And I, I think there's a real commitment to accelerating you know, the success and in bringing innovation to treat um, cancer research. Uh, there's a website. Uh, KIMIT.edu that you can go on and they have, you know, they have some, some really interesting educational uh, materials there which you can follow. Um, tonight's uh, presentation will cover uh, the areas of engineered devices and tools with potential uh, to change the way we detect and monitor cancer. Uh, Professor Michael Sima, who's a Koch Institute faculty member, will speak on some of the innovations coming out of his lab. Um, and uh, we also have uh, Dr. 
uh, Kevin Knopf, who's uh, a practicing clinician and also an MIT grad, um, and an MD uh, from UCSF, who's a practicing clinician in uh, hematology and, and oncology. Um, and further, we have uh, Wendy Hutton, who's a very experienced and well-known uh, venture capitalist who specializes in uh, transferring technology from uh, the innovators, the universities, and the inventions uh, to practical uh, applications, you know, in the marketplace. She's going to tell her a bit about her experiences in that world. And so I think uh, you should be getting a very nice overview tonight uh, in one sector about the innovation, you know, the transfer, and the actual need and application of that technology for uh, the treatment of, of cancer in patients. Uh, we'll begin the program uh, with a presentation by uh, Dr. Knopf. He's a clinical oncologist and director of the San Francisco Cancer Center. In his practice, he treats an, the entire spectrum of hematologic and oncologic conditions uh, with attending privileges at California Pacific Medical Center. He also directs uh, the oncology clinic at St. Luke's Hospital in San Francisco. Uh, received, he uh, obtained his undergraduate degree at MIT, and then, um, as he was explaining to me earlier this evening, uh, didn't take any time off. He went uh, straight to getting his MD at uh, UCSF and has been, um, you know, a highly productive clinician ever since. So we'll start the presentation uh, with Dr. Knopf. Thanks. Thanks. Um, it really is an honor to speak before such an illustrious audience. Um, so we're going to go over an overview of challenges in cancer. This may take a little longer than 10 minutes. I, I tried rehearsing once or twice. And I'm a general oncologist, so I see whatever comes in. I still retain some curiosity about things that I learned during my four years at MIT. And it's many times a day that I miss uh, MIT, particularly the sense of humor. This is a, the undergrads that have hacked the green building to play Tetris on it. So I figure <coughs> if they're smart enough to learn to play Tetris on the green building, that a cure for cancer can't be too far behind. Um, so at an MIT, when you're an undergrad, you have problem sets. So I've created a problem set for tonight. We only have two problems. Number one is we're not curing enough cancers. And number two is we need more funding for R&D. So we've got a room full of very smart people. Uh, we only have an hour, so we're going to have to get partial credit on this. Um, so we'll go forth, and I'll try and define some of the elements of the problem, and then we'll, we'll go about a solution. So these are the main goals of cancer care. These are the things that you ask yourself whenever a patient comes in the office. The first uh, goal, which we always want, is to be able to cure a patient of cancer. Uh, the second goal is to prolong their survival, and by that we mean that they live a lot longer with a good quality of life. And then the third goal is just to palliate. And since I've been practicing for the past 12 years, we've seen a dramatic shift uh, from palliate to prolonged survival. We haven't seen quite as many improvements in cures, but that's where we want to go. But we've got a lot of new medicines that are peaking people a lot longer, and that's a big bonus for us. So some people would say that one of the ways to cure cancer would be to make it a disease like diabetes that you control for a number of years, and then, uh, in effect, you have cured somebody. Um, this is a patient of mine who's cured. His name is Ken. Uh, he had a diffuse large cell lymphoma, and he got a chemotherapy regimen called RCHOP. R stands for toxin. It's a monoclonal antibody that was developed by a uh, scientist here at Genentech, the first monoclonal antibody to be commercialized. Um, and you see a little bit of its target there. When you add it to chemotherapy, you get synergistic cell kill. So this is one of those unusual medicines, or probably only three or four in the past 12 years, that can increase your chance of curing somebody of cancer. Um, and Genentech really has another great drug called Herceptin and a third drug called, drug called Avastin that we use a lot in the clinic. Um, so we're going to talk about some facts here. Um, this is from a Talking Heads song. Uh, and unfortunately, facts don't do what we want them to in cancer. So we have a tough target there. And we're also going to talk about some facts of the U.S. healthcare system, <coughs> um, which complicates our ability to both treat cancer and develop new drugs. So uh, this is a little bit of what Wendy will go over. But the FDA approves drugs and devices that are safe and effective. That's their limit there. But in the U.K., we have organizations called NICE in Western Europe that look at the cost effectiveness of drugs and devices. So for example, there's a therapy for prostate cancer called Provenge which is a vaccine which extends survival about four months. And you can calculate a cost-effectiveness ratio for that of $300,000, which is very expensive by 
any metric that you use in sort of league tables and things like that. So health economics is a very interesting thing. It's a zero-sum game, um, which makes it very interesting. People spend a lot of effort and, and agony over many zero-sum games, such as the stock market is another zero-sum game, or the World Series, or uh, the Super Bowl. These are all zero-sum games. What's interesting about healthcare is that there's so many players in this game, it makes it much more complicated. So in the Super Bowl, we just have the 49ers versus the Ravens. But in healthcare, we have at least 20 or 30 people all competing within this game. Um, and each of their perspectives may differ from the other people's perspectives. Um, and this is from another MIT alum. There was actually a sim game where you could play healthcare economics for fun <coughs> um, with all these players here. Um, <coughs> so some things are really, really innovative and some things are not quite so innovative. But this is innovative in a, in a sort of way. Um, and this is just a little freshman organic chemistry. So this was a drug called Prilosec, which was used for acid reflux disease. And when the drug went off patent, the company decided to, to re-engineer the drug so that they had another branded drug. And what they basically did, um, this person says it's astonishing pharmaceutical ingenuity, is they cut the molecule in half, submitted that to the FDA, and got that approved. Um, and then they got all the doctors to prescribe it. So they made a billion dollars a year profit from this. So in the healthcare game, we'd say that the drug company won big here. And there's a question about who lost. Did the patients lose? Did Medicare lose? Did the payers lose? Um, we could say that this was a billion dollars that all went away from healthcare, but in actual fact, this is a company that spent a lot of money developing drugs for cancer over the past 10 years um, since this drug was introduced. And so far, I think they've had one drug that made it past the FDA for a small indication um, in thyroid cancer. So uh, investing in healthcare is a high risk, uh, high game. Um, this is an engineer's approach to the healthcare system. There's a lot of entropy and friction here. And I think that we could re-engineer the system here to free up a lot of money for cancer research. So if you look at this, there's about $700 billion a year of waste in the healthcare system. Um, unwarranted use, over-testing, administrative claims, duplication. These are all sort of errors that we make in the healthcare system. Um, and if we could undo these errors somehow, we could free up $700 billion a year for cancer research just from the public funding. Um, this is sort of a depressing slide if you, if you think about it. So, <clears throat> the, the red line down there, the E&M, that's how many patients the doctors see. That's evaluation and management. But if you look, that we see a tremendous amount of testing and imaging ordered for the same amount of patients. Um, and we actually don't see a big improvement for outcomes for all this money we spend. So again, I would consider this sort of friction to the healthcare system. Um, and just today I saw this article come up from Forbes that if you rate your doctor, it could be bad for your health because if you give them a bad rating, they're going to try and get a higher rating by ordering more tests and procedures on you. Um, so uh, this is something that I think the doctors are really starting to wonder about and, and finally starting to do something about. Um, in fact, there's a campaign by the internist called Choosing Wisely, which is sort of informing doctors how to think better about what they do. So this one says, don't do imaging for an uncomplicated headache. So in case you didn't learn it during medical school, you know, not everybody needs a CT scan if they come into your office for a headache. Um, this is a complicated concept even for, uh, I think, oncologists to get. but. When we have screening, there's an epidemiologic concept called lead time bias. So you may have the onset of disease very early, and you may be able to pick it up very early, but it may not affect your overall survival if it's a very slow-growing or indolent process. So in this example, we have somebody who can be picked up with a cancer from 1989 um, versus 1992 when they have symptoms, but they live the same amount of time. So it's a lead time bias of about three years, which is sort of in the patient's worst interest to pick up something early if you're not going to make a difference. Um, and economically will double your costs. So whenever we talk about screening programs or surveillance programs, we have to put in whether there's a lead time bias um, there. And this is a problem with early detection of recurrent cancer because a lot of times picking recurrence up early won't make the patient live any longer. They just might start getting treated a little bit early. So this is something we actually want to avoid. Um, I think this is like the only molecular biology slide I put in, but cancer, particularly epithelial cancers, is a multi-step genetic process. So. What you're looking at on the left is a, a lumen of breast tissue, and then what you're looking on the right is a cancer. And as it goes from normal tissue to proliferative tissue to cancer, it acquires different oncogenic changes along the way. Um, so these accumulation of genetic changes move it from benign tissue through ductal carcinoma in situ through invasive cancer. And so what we want to do here is rather than maybe diagnose it early, we want to be able to pick it up early and then alter the biologic pathway so that we take those genetic changes away. And this is where molecular biology and I think um, uh, engineering can help a lot. So we want to maybe identify these oncogenes 
and change them back so that cancer cells don't appear um, and treat this in vivo. So there's actually an FDA approved medicine called tamoxifen that you can give to women who have some of these proliferative lesions that will decrease their chance of getting invasive cancer. So that was the first FDA drug approved for chemo prevention. But we expect that there's going to be a lot more sort of chemo prevention coming down the pike as we understand more and more about the molecular biology of cancer. Um, this is a really tough concept, but you'll see this in the newspapers, and this would be a whole hour talk in itself, but we are overdiagnosing a lot of cancers. So this is a big problem in breast cancer and prostate cancer in particular. So in breast cancer, the latest estimates are that we diagnose about 1.3 million American women with breast cancer who didn't need to be treated. And with things are as they are in America, once you're diagnosed, you're down the pathway of surgery and maybe radiation, maybe chemotherapy, maybe hormonal therapy. So what we don't know is how to judge these cancers that may be indolent and slow growing <clears throat> and not do all this stuff uh, for the patient that may not really help her in the long run. And as our imaging gets better, as we use MRI to screen people for breast cancer, we're going to pick up more of these background cancers and we may be doing more harm than good. Um, some estimates say that we're, we're overdiagnosing three to one sort of indolent cancers to real cancers. But the idea of having a cancer is such a fearful concept that this is a very hard concept to really uh, get across to people. It's a little bit easier in prostate cancer because there's been so much in the literature by Dr. Brawley and other people that the, the prostate cancer is not necessarily cancer that's going to grow and metastasize and cause damage to the host. If you look at the statistics, if you're an 80-year-old man, you have about a 50% of having prostate cancer if you look at it. So obviously more men die with prostate cancer than of prostate cancer. Um, and as we got screening better with PSA, we're getting a lot more early stage disease that's diagnosed. So even at our institution, for, for patients that have very early stage disease, such as what we call a Gleason score less than six and a low PSA, we're observing some of these men. So this is a big area where I think we could improve what we do by understanding what molecular biologic changes are with these cancers that might herald whether they're going to progress to a point where we need to do something about them versus just watch them. And to me, if you had a sensor you could implant in the prostate that would sort of get hooked up to a gene chip and tell you this cancer is sort of just indolent, leave it alone, versus there's some changes here you need to operate, that we could help with this problem of overdiagnosis, which is a very complicated problem in oncology. Um, just because we're, we're from MIT doesn't mean that more technology is always better. Um, and Ezekiel Manuel, who's also an oncologist, wrote about this in the New York Times in January 2012. So proton therapy for prostate cancer is very cool. It's got very interesting physics. You get a better penumbra. You get better treatment definition. But for the patient, you don't cure them any more often. You don't actually improve anything that we can tell. Um, but it's become very fashionable to do this, and it has a price premium of $50,000 with no increase in survival. So we would call that economic entropy, uh, if we're going to use an economic term. <coughs> um, and play the healthcare game with this, they're going to be winners and losers. So the winners are the manufacturers of the proton therapy machine and the people who own the proton therapy machine, which are very distinguished cancer centers, by the way. Um, however, you know, a classmate of mine from med school called me and said, should I invest $30,000 in a proton machine? I said, oh, I don't know. Um, but you do lose when you do this. So the health insurance companies and Medicare lose because they're paying $50,000 and getting nothing in return. Um, cancer research loses unless all the profit from this that MD Anderson gets goes back into cancer research. The patient may or may not lose. They probably don't lose a big way. Um, they have the same survival. Businesses which have to pay health care costs, they lose by doing something like this. And uh, just because this is radiation, biotech and pharma are losing out because there's less research money for them. Um, if we're doing our problem set, it would be a double mistake to overtreat a prostate cancer with proton therapy, so you've made two bad mistakes. No partial credit for that. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a young patient of mine who's probably cured a breast cancer named Marissa. She's four years out. Um, I think in this picture she's five months pregnant as well. And when she comes in the office, we sort of do a history and physical and see how she's doing and chat. Um, but if she's not having any symptoms, the, the literature in, in oncology says don't do any surveillance testing. Don't do any tumor markers. Don't do any scans. Um, and so we have a reminder for oncologists. We have a list of five things we're not supposed to do that are economically unsound, don't make sense. And this is number four. And so number four was taught to me when I was a fellow at the NCI in 1996. But now it's just sort of getting to the general oncology community. You can do a little economic analysis here. You avoid an unnecessary blood test, an unnecessary PET scan. It frees up $8,200 for cancer research. You do that 10 times, you have enough for a postdoc uh, in a lab. Um, so when these patients come in, you know, it, it behooves us to be careful not to order tests that aren't going to help them. And this is also a lead time bias problem. 
Uh, this is a young woman who's cured of Hodgkin's disease. Um, she got a regimen called ABVD, which was developed in the 1970s at the NCI and the Milan Cancer Institute. So even though we haven't had any improvement in the chemotherapy for this disease since the 1970s, we still have a very high cure rate, um, 80 to 90 percent early stage disease. And here I use a PET scan to sort of stratify patients to see who can be spared radiation therapy. So we used to be very dogmatic that patients would get some chemotherapy and then they'd get radiation therapy to the residual area, um, and there are problems with that. Um, but you can do an economic analysis of this. So an interim PET scan costs you about eight grand. You avoid radiation that costs you 20,000, and you save $12,000 per patient. In addition, you avoid giving radiation to the chest wall, which is associated with a very high rate of coronary artery disease and secondary cancers. So this is a win-win-win for almost all patients, and this is where we want to take oncology clinically to, to be more cost-effective so that we're helping patients as best as we can. Um, this is a very naive view of nanotechnology, but um, we'll let Dr. Seema uh, tell us how this works. But when we give patients chemotherapy or radiation therapy, we're trying to kill cancer cells, actively dividing cells. And each time we administer one of these treatments, we kill a certain percentage of cells but the remaining cells can repopulate and they grow exponentially and pretty soon you can have a recurrence. So the reason we can cure Hodgkin's disease is that the chemotherapy is so good that we kill enough cells that the remaining cells can get captured by the immune system and get rid of. But in other cancers, we can't cure them because chemotherapy doesn't work well enough. So I was thinking that we could use maybe targeted approaches, including nano-based technology, to specifically target the residual remaining cancer and increase the dose intensification while sparing normal tissue, maybe increase our chance of cure that way. So when we give chemotherapy, the reason there are side effects is because collateral tissue gets involved, um, gets exposed to the chemotherapy, and any sort of dividing cell can have toxicity from that. But if we have specific therapies, we'll treat the cancer and we won't cause toxicity. So this approach may increase the uh, number of cancers that we can cure. Um, in 20 years of medical school, I think this is the only time I had to use a logarithm. And doctors can only do logarithms in base 10, so these are what we would call an unnatural logarithm. Um, on the left is, is a diagram of how we kill cancer cells with radiation. Um, and the lower values there are obviously more cancer kill. And one of the things about radiation is the way it works is the radiation generates free radicals by oxygen molecules, and those attack cancer cells and cause programmed cell death or apoptosis. So you're going to do a much better job of killing cancer cells if you have a highly oxygenated area. Um, if it's deoxygenated, you need a much higher dose of radiation, and you may not be able to kill that cancer. So oxygenation is sort of the key. When you radiate a tumor, you sort of do it in multiple fractions so that the, the rim there can get oxygen to it so you can keep killing it. So this is one of the reasons radiation is given in multiple fractions. The one on the right is, is chemotherapy log cell kill. And so in the top example, we've, we've got a chemotherapy that kills um, in order in magnitudes of 10 each time we give it. And we can get the cancer below the limit of detection, even, say, on a PET scan. But the patient has enough cancer cells that they're going to relapse eventually and potentially die of the cancer. If we have a better log cell kill of two, giving the same number of chemotherapy treatments, we can get them down to a very low level where they may be cured. So one strategy that may work is to combine some conventional chemotherapy to get us down to a very low log order of cancer cells and then use something that's really specific to target the remaining cancer cells. And this is a way that I think we could increase our chance of cure uh, from what we have now, which is not as high as we'd like. This is another patient of mine named Steve and his wife Sandy, and he has a cancer called multiple myeloma. So when I started um, 12 years ago, people with myeloma lived about three years. And since that time, we've had the introduction of five new drugs, and now we've got the median survival up to seven years. Um, some patients go 10 years. So we're not curing these people. We're, we're on that prolonged survival, and we think if we have enough drugs, we can keep them alive longer. But in this, in this disease, some people do a stem cell transplant to try and kill that remaining last group of cancer cells. And it doesn't work to increase the chance of cure. But this seems like a situation where it would be ripe to try something that would kill that remaining 1 or 2 percent of cells. Um, and economically, if you have something that cures a cancer, it usually is going to turn out to be cost effective um, because of the way the denominator works. So I, I thought I'd close with just ovarian cancer, which is a tough problem to treat oncologically. Um, obviously, if we can screen a cancer and prevent it from happening, no matter what the organ, that counts as a cure. So any improvement in screening that we make would be great. Um, and then if we can increase the cure rate with treatment, that would be great. So uh, ovarian cancer, we have a certain subset of, of women who have a, a gene line mutation, a germline mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2. These are DNA mismatch repair 
enzymes of a sort, cell checkpoint enzymes. Um, and if they acquire a second hit, they're at high risk for getting breast cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, and right now, we don't have really good screening for them. So a lot of them are electing for prophylactic mastectomy or prophylactic oophorectomy, having their ovaries removed uh, after they've had children. And even the best screening tests we have right now in this very enriched population where the pretest probability of disease is much higher doesn't work very well. So what we want to do is have a better approach to increase our screening yield, to be more specific and have a better positive predicting value, where we could maybe say to a woman, yes, you have BRCA2, but you, your ovaries are fine, you're not going to develop cancer, just go on. Or we could monitor them over time and say, you know, we're seeing some dysplastic changes here, and this oncogene's on, and this oncogene's on, maybe it's time to have your ovaries taken out. And maybe we could avoid some women having to have surgery, stratify their risk, and give them some better information than, than we're able to give her now. Um, ovarian cancer is an interesting cancer to get this approach as well because of the geography of it. So most of the women that we see who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer have disease throughout their abdominal cavity at the time of diagnosis, particularly in the omentum, in the lining here behind the stomach and ascites, which is fluid there. So when we have these patients go to surgery, they really debulk all the tumor they can and they, they give you a report on how much disease is left in the omentum in terms of millimeters. So what you like to have is minimal residual disease, the less the better. And then we follow this surgery with chemotherapy. Um, for many years, we gave this intravenously, and it would distribute to the cancer cells in the abdominal cavity. Um, more recently, a lot of oncologists have embraced giving it intraperitoneally, where we put the chemotherapy inside the peritoneum, and we have the patient rotate so that the chemotherapy can actually get to the tumor pockets on the omentum, and there it becomes sort of a surface area physics problem that I guess would be good for 801. Um, but, you know, what we want to do is be able to intensify the amount of chemotherapy we're giving to these remaining uh, tumor nodules while sparing the normal organs. So if we can dose intensify chemotherapy here by, by giving it specifically to the cancer and targeting in such a way, we could probably increase our cure rate for these patients from the 40 to 50 percent we see now, which is not what we'd really like, to something more like 80 or 90 percent. So research here might be very fruitful. Um, and it might be easier to do something here than it is in, in a cancer that's sort of diffusely metastatic where it's harder to get the therapy to the area so if it's hiding out in the bone or the liver or the lung. So I, I think I've got 10 minutes down. Um, this is our problem set. We've got some sort of way of approaching curing cancers that we can talk a little bit about more. And we talked a little bit about funding. We talked about an easy $700 billion to try and get from the system to fund R&D. Um, so I think we've got enough partial credit to move forward. Thanks. Maybe we have time to take a couple of questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask uh, Dr. Knopf any questions about oncology. Yeah. I guess we're, we're trying to get this for the internet. There's a lot of people out there in the world who'd like to hear about this. So thanks for, thanks for going to the speaker. Yeah, you mentioned the approach of using, let's say, chemo to hit 98% and then using specific um, uh, uh, directed methods. And you mentioned this kind of approach in several of these areas. Is this still being done at experimental stage as to how much you do with chemo, how much you do with, the, with specifics? Or is, is there already a, set up a, you know, a method to determine how much of each and, and when? Well, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the ways we've done chemotherapy till now has been very empiric. Before we had breakthroughs in molecular biology where we could tell how we were killing cancer cells, we would just sort of try cancer cells and see how much we were killing, um, first in cell culture and then maybe in mice and then try it in humans and then through clinical trials. So the idea of dose intensification really came only through the use of stem cell transplants where we give very high doses of chemotherapy to try and kill every last cancer cell. And then we reinfuse stem cells so that the bone marrow can repopulate and the person has an immune system. Um, and the example I gave of myeloma, we've done a lot of stem cell transplants um, in these patients, but we're not impacting their overall survival. So we're not able to kill that remaining 1%. So it would seem like um, what we want to do is, is focus in part, if we have good chemotherapy for a cancer, on getting a really great chemotherapy that can mop up that residual 1%. And so a clinical trial might have to be designed in several stages um, in order to reach that, that goal. Um, hey, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that I, was, that I had is, what do you think about if um, all of cancers were characterized at a molecular level, and then the benefits of research 
if you could kind of crowdsource all that molecular data on cancers being classified at a molecular level, of that benefit to research and potentially finding a cure? Well, it's a couple, couple answers to that question. Um, you know, definitely we're on the road of looking at molecular targets within uh, cancer cells and trying to exploit that molecularly. I didn't put up any complicated molecular biology slides, but there's a lot of redundancy and multiple pathways in the system, so it might require 10 or 20 drugs to actually eradicate a cancer. Um, and there's a lot of challenges. For example, if you, if you look at a cancer and you take a sample here and a sample here, they may have different molecular characterizations. So, you know, I think the Koch Institute is as likely as anyone else to sort of bridge molecular biology and, and engineering to solve this problem. Um, how to get that data shared among colleagues and stuff is, a, is another complicated thing, um, uh, you know, because everybody wants to have their own sort of research agenda and their own sort of discoveries. There are a lot of programs for the NCI where, where genetic basis of cancer is shared online and molecular biologists are, are starting to work together. Um, and so I think this is maybe in a way in its, in its toddlerhood, you know, I think we'll see a lot more molecular biology and therapeutic targets identified over the next 10 years. Um, just as we've improved the science. Hi, my question is sort of related. Yeah. At what point, you mentioned the whole issue of breast cancer screening and the cost-benefit analysis, and there's been a lot of discussion about that recently. At what point would there be enough data, do you think, in terms of correlating molecular signatures to specific can breast cancer tissue to be able to be confident that it's definitely going to be an indolent cancer or there is a treatment ca that can positively affect the outcome? Well, we, we've started to collect this molecular data on breast cancer, and we recharacterized it um, into several subtypes. We call them luminal A, luminal B, triple negative, and R2 positive. And the luminal A is sort of the most benign one. And I think we're at a point where we can say that, like, for example, if a woman has luminal A breast cancer and has a lumpectomy, her chance of a local relapse is much lower than somebody with a triple negative cancer. And in some of those cases, we can emit radiation. Um, the, the gene chips are out there and you get these green and red patterns. We're not at a place yet where we could sort of look at a cancer that's, that's in a woman's breast and say, this one you can watch for a while. Um, I, I think if people look in that direction, they might come up with ideas within the next five to 10 years. It's a very emotionally charged thing, the idea of having a cancer and not treating it. Um, but uh, the problem of overdiagnosis is actually it, it's so much in the public's mind now that I'll have women come in who've had a breast cancer and say, really, I wonder if I could have let this one just sit for a while and it wouldn't have done anything. So I think things will, will change there to really starting to ask those tough questions. Yeah, just, I mean, I used to work for Affymetrix for many years and was involved with genomics consortiums in cancer. And so I think there's an intersection at which point the cost of technology and the data are sufficient to make it so that no one has to go unscreened. That's right. just really the point. And wh where's that turning point? Right. Well, with screening, we, we talk about sensitivity and specificity, so we don't want to pick up a lot of things that are going to scare people, and, and uh, this will continue to evolve in a good way, I think, for the patients. Yeah, thank, you. Uh, I'm, thank you for your presentation. I'm struggling with simplifying my question, which is there was an allusion earlier to the work being done at the Cancer Genomics Atlas at NCI looking at the yeah. uh, biomolecular characterization of a variety of tumors. Uh, what do you see as the timeline and challenges to transitioning into the clinic in terms of physician education and building the infrastructure to support the kind of screening that can be done that will allow a much more targeted treatment of uh, tumors on the basis of their molecular biology rather than their organ location? I think the clinicians are already savvy to looking at molecular characteristics. For example, a common one is if you're CD20, you can use Rituxan, and if you're KRAS wild type, you can use this drug. So I think the clinicians are there. Right now, we actually, we have a lot more tests than we know how to interpret. Um, so I, I think it'll just sort of sort itself out over time. Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, a, a very accessible presentation, uh, at Thanks. least for me as a, as a layperson. Um, I'm a physicist, uh, not a clinician, um, but I have an interest in cancer. And one of the things, just viewing from the outside, is that there's a zoo of different genetic and molecular forms that cancer takes. And so the forms of, of cancer treatment that I've been most interested in are those that work across a broad spectrum. 
-huh. um, I was hoping that you could comment on a few approaches that chemotherapy has, uh, uh, in chemotherapy that have either reduced the toxicity to, the to normal cells, to the rest of the system, or may allow for dose intensification. Um, one is basically causing a fasting. Uh, the patient doesn't eat for a fairly long period of time, and anecdotally, this reduces uh, hair loss and uh, problems with the digestive tract. It, what may cause is just a reduction in the, the cell division. Um, if that works, you might be able to dose intensify, and there are a few things going into, I think, phase one and phase two trials now. And, and then there are approaches that are broad-spectrum chemotherapies that, that target um, solid cancers, but they're, they're pro-drugs. They, they, they don't activate until they reach the anoxic core of, or hypoxic core of solid cancers. Unfortunately, those seem to have been they're only going into phase trials with traditional chemotherapy. So one of the biggest advantages of being able to, to not hit the white blood cells, um, it seems to be falling by the wayside. But Do you, have it, it a, seems you want to constant. state a question because we're kind of running short on time? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm well, I, I think there's a lot of promising approaches, and, and the road to actually getting them into the clinic can be difficult and, and hard and long, and longer than patients would like, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Thanks. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> the extended clinical trials process, of course, helps keep harmful drugs off the market, but it also holds back or creates hurdles for drugs that could potentially be helpful and save lives. It would also seem to me it tends to squelch the kind of proliferation of innovation <laughs> bottoms up that you see in IT, for example. What are your thoughts on this overall? Uh, is the net uh, positive or negative, or, or uh, how do you think about it? Well, I, I think medicine is much harder and slower to innovate than IT because um, <coughs> of the legal and human risks involved. But, but I was talking to Dr. Seema both on the conference call and, and before the talk here about the fact that you could use neoadjuvant therapy trials. You could take an organ that's intact and give a chemotherapy drug and see if you get a complete pathological response, and that might be a signal to a good cancer therapy rather than an extended clinical trial with long overall survival endpoints. So it's a, it's a process that requires really the approval of the FDA to, to change the endpoints for us to get these drugs approved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, doctor, just a very quick question on your slide about prostate cancer. Um, you mentioned that you need new technologies to um, assist in determining which ones will kill, which ones may not. You mentioned Gleason. I thought that that was the sort of the purpose of the Gleason score. The higher it is, the more aggressive and so forth. Could you clarify that for me, please? Yeah, I mean, the prostate cancer for watching have a very low Gleason score and a low PSA. Uh, what, I, what I think I meant there is we need better things besides just Gleason score and PSA. We need some molecular tools to mm -hmm. give us more information about which prostate cancers are sort of indolent and which ones are serious. So I think that's an area that's ripe for uh, involvement of more molecular biology and maybe more devices to help guide us than just the PSA and the Gleason score we have. So those characteristics we have now are good, but they're not great. Um, so that's all I Thanks. really meant to say with that. Great. Uh, thanks very much. I'd like to say I think the audience had some really great questions. So, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kevin Knopf again for his uh, contribution this evening. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Michael Sima uh, about an understanding of the clinical need for better cancer detection. These are very exciting ideas and inventions uh, which he's been working on. Uh, Michael Sima is the David H. Koch Professor of Engineering at MIT, uh, faculty member of the Koch Institute. He earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry in 1982 and his PhD in chemical engineering in 1986, uh, both degrees from Berkeley. He's co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed scientific publications and holds 37 patents. And has been involved in co-founding uh, four companies, Microchips Inc. T2 Biosystems, Springleaf Therapeutics, and Terrace Biomedical. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Michael Seema. Thank you.
So I'm going to uh, uh, sort of abridge my talk a little bit so I can help get back on time. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, there were a couple things brought up in the earlier earlier talk that I, I feel really passionate about, uh, and uh, but I'm going to focus just on the diagnostics aspects of some of the things that were mentioned. Um, you know, we think of medical diagnostics now as fancy scanners and complicated instruments, and uh, these are obviously very expensive and and uh, require um, uh, operators that really know what they're doing. Uh, but some of these technologies are be actually being driven um, by cost. Um, the, what I'm showing here is a, a um, virtual colonoscopy, and uh, which uh, as soon as you turn 50, this looks very, very good because uh, what it means is, is that uh, instead of having three people there, uh, you only have the one person operating the instrument. Secondly, uh, the patient uh, recovers very rapidly from this procedure, so this facility can run a lot more patients through it in principle. So while this is still not widely available, it's increasingly available, and it's being driven by the economics. So technology can be part of our our future here, even if it's just trying to be as good as what's being done uh, currently, uh, as long as we can you know, think of it like an engineering problem. The gold standard for cancer diagnosis is to look at a piece of tissue, and there's all different ways to do that. Um, you don't get treated for cancer until somebody looks at a p piece of tissue and carefully analyzes the morphological and chemical signals associated with, uh, with uh, the cancer in that tissue. This, in this picture right here, it's a common way of needle biopsy. It's an invasive procedure. It's a surgical procedure. And uh, as I said, it's the gold standard for cancer diagnosis. But the problem that you have here is because it's an invasive procedure, you can't do this very often. Uh, it's not something that you typically do, you know, during the course of therapy very often. And, um, and you'd like to know how the cancer is changing with therapy. And um, we don't have access to the tools with the kind of fidelity that you can get with uh, these types of, of um, methods to actually get the tissue. So uh, one project was to try and build a, into this invasive procedure a way of leaving something behind that I can interrogate non-invasively through the course of the therapy. And what that means is I can leave behind a material that's chemically sensitive to its environment and then I can read out that, that uh, change in the material non-invasively. And the idea would be that uh, I just piggyback on the existing procedure. It's no more invasive than the original procedure. And this idea resulted, at least in preclinical models, resulted in dev developing devices, very tiny devices, that change their MRI contrast in the presence of really small amounts of proteins. So in this case, uh, what I have here is a very small device. In this case, it has a, a um, material inside of it that is in equilibrium with the surroundings. A semi-permeable membrane separates this material from the surroundings, and so none of this stuff can get out. And the target protein, in this case, can get in. And over the course of time, this is an MRI image here, I can see the, the content, the contrast inside the device change from one color to another. And I can read this out uh, and tell what's actually happening in the sur surrounding tissue. This was mentioned earlier, hypoxia is uh, a relevant 
chemical marker. So it's, this is sort of, rather than talking about a very complicated biomarker, I'm going to talk about something that's very simple, oxygen. And oxygen, as was mentioned earlier, is an, an factor in determining what the appropriate radiation dose might be. And we don't have really good ways to measure oxygen. Uh, you can do an invasive procedure and put a oxygen sensor into the tumor and actually measure it. Uh, but again, you have to do this invasive procedure. So um, what we did was develop a, a material. This is a silicone material. This is a millimeter marker here. That um, silicone, medical grade silicone, has the property that it absorbs a lot of oxygen. Now, oxygen being paramagnetic, um, can these little molecules act as magnets and they affect the proton spins on, on the polymer. And so I can measure what I'm doing in an MRI is actually measuring the relaxivity, how fast these protons relax in a per perturbed magnetic field. And as a result, I can measure in the image intensity here, uh, from the image intensity of this material, I can tell what the oxygen content is around it. So potentially, if I were to leave this little, well, here's a, just a scanner that, at the Coke that we use to do this. I'll skip that. Here's a small animal. We can use uh, signal processing in the MRI to, here's my little one millimeter thick uh, uh, injected device here. I can do signal processing to just get the contrast of the device. So basically, the only thing I see in the image is the device. And so the, the brightness of this image will be a direct measurement of the, of the oxygen content in the surrounding tissue. The, um, I show it as a one millimeter rod one millimeter by five millimeters here, but what we're now doing is just making very tiny little beads of this material, and instead of using a, a, um, a biopsy needle, we can use just a normal needle and inject it into, into any tissue. And uh, silicone is, uh, um, has, toxicity is very well known. Um, and uh, we can uh, actually do very small 200 micron size regions of this material can be used to measure the local oxygen tension. Oh, this is just a respired gas experiment, so we can um, make the animal breathe oxygen or air and back to oxygen again, and we can see the image contrast go up and down in almost real time. It's pretty impressive. Uh, now, people always ask about, well, you need an MRI to do this. Well, actually, it's pretty simple to put a little bit of the instrument on the device. So this is a device that can fit inside of a, a um, biopsy needle. There's a little coil there, and inside is the, the material that's sensitive to its chemical environment. And then there's a little capacitor at the end to do the, the right uh, frequency match. And we can inductively couple to this with a very small device and actually only measure the relaxivity inside this little device. And um, that means we don't even need an MRI. We can just uh, do a handheld instrument to talk to this. And then I just want to end by um, mentioning something that's related to this. You might not be, you might be surprised to, to learn that um, uh, some of the first applications of this technology is not actually in vivo as I've been describing, it's in vitro. So um, uh, we are using the same basic chemical principles that I've applied inside the animal or hopefully someday inside the person to um, doing it in a test tube. And so this test will be uh, being, as a clinical trial being conducted by this company, T2 Biosystems, that will be using this exquisitely sensitive technology to do very early detection of, in this case, their first trial, candidemia, in patients that are immunocom, it's very common, uh, well, it is, uh, it occurs in patients that are immunocompromised, which a lot of ca cancer patients are. And um, we can do this in about 90 minutes, determine 
with uh, very high sensitivity what patients ha have this disease, whereas normally it's done in blo blood culture. So I guess I wanted to end with this because I said, you know, what we find is that when we do these, um, try out these new ideas, you never know exactly where it's going to be applied. And um, while I have this sort of long-term view that this, we're going to take this chemistry and put it inside of this device, along the way we learned how to do it in vitro. And, um, and the easy application turned out to be something like candidemia. And uh, this is going to happen, and we're, we're pretty, pretty happy about the outcome. So I think I'll just end there, and, and maybe rather than taking questions, we'll go to you, and then we'll all answer questions, okay? How's that? Questions regarding you know their talks. I, I think there, there's a lot of a lot of subjects covered here. Um, I, I think it's it's hard in a presentation like this to go into depth in all the technologies that are out there that are coming along to diagnose and treat cancer. There there are quite a few of them. It's it's a field where I work as well, and um, you know I think we're going to see a lot lot happening over the next uh, 10 to 20 years, um, both on the on the di diagnosis side and on the therapy side. So any, any further questions from the audience? We'll have a few more <coughs> time. You know, I, I think you know, while, while the, while the uh, questioners are, are reaching the, the mic, um, you know, I think we are facing a bit of a crisis in payments. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the system. These new therapies, many of them are very expensive. Um, and I, I think basically you have to prove that they're going to work and they're going to make a difference uh, to patients and to the system, or, or probably we're not going to see them adopted. I mean, I think that's more where we're headed uh, in the future. So, what would you like to ask? Um, so, uh, if this is really a question for each of you, but I'll, I'll start with Michael. So, Michael, I, <clears throat> I think it's great you found a in, in vivo or in vitro application somewhat outside the oncology area, yeah. but if you were going to pick an oncology a cancer to start with, with the type of things you talked about, which would it be? And then Kevin and I, Kevin and Wendy, I'd also be curious hearing about what Michael's doing, if you have any thoughts about where where you would suggest he, he works. Well, uh, any, uh, I mean, the, the, are you talking about the hypoxia sensor yeah. for a specific? Yeah, I mean, any of these that um, any cancer, you know, m most uh, large tumors do become hypoxic. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. Is that? Is it on? It's not a voltage. Now it. Okay. Try this mic. See if that's better. So, in principle, any of these tumors that are. Um, oh, no. uh, any of these. Now no. it's going. Okay. All right. So, any of these tumors uh, that are. Sufficiently large that they can become hypoxic uh, and non-operable. This would be a, a, a kind of. I, I like to think of it as a as a sort of solid solid state um, image contrast agent. Um, and when you think about a contrast agent that you inject, its development pathway is a lot like a drug. And uh, whereas this potentially is more like a device. Um, and particularly what's attractive for the oxygen sensor is that it's the materials that have been used in many um, medical products. So I, I chose that as an example because I thought of all the things that uh, I could do with these very exquisite biomarker sensors, those have a longer, in my mind, a longer development pathway. Now the question is, is this, is the value proposition as great for an oxygen sensor as opposed to some um, biomarker, you know, PSA or something like that, that uh, or for ovarian cancer or something that, to me, that, that's the real question that has to be worked out. But I, I do think that from a development standpoint, the you know leaving behind a small bead, a lot looks like a lot of the beads that are used already, um, 
this it just means makes it a little bit sooner type of product. I think you're asking oh. donation. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I think if we're looking at micro sensors where we're going to try and send some feedback around a, a tumor type, that we probably look at a tumor that's localized geographically to one area. So maybe a brain tumor like a glioblastoma multiformin, you could implant it at the time of surgical resection because that's a nasty tumor that comes back and really radiated. Mm -hmm. And uh, prostate is only walnut size, so that would seem a small area. And there's a value proposition if, if you sort of use what you get in feedback and then change your therapeutic strategy early to something that works better, mm -hmm. um, then you can inherently sort of save money along the way. Um, thank you guys. I have a few questions, but I'll try to hold it to two quick ones. And um, the first, um, and I'll just ask both of them and sit down, but um, the first is I'd like to know what you, each of you guys think about uh, companion diagnostics and their future in the industry. And you guys might you know, want to explain that um, when, we, when we talk about that. And also, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge in developing therapeutics and diagnostics? Um, and if you think that one of those is is it is it the science? Is it fun? Is it the dollars for science, or is it you know sharing the information that's developed? Um, those are some food for thought. But I'm interested in each of your thoughts on the biggest need. Well, I think in oncology certainly is that old mic. What? Use both. Use both. Both mics. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he was he was giving me a lot of signals back there. That's why. <laughs> um, so I think in oncology, um, certainly you have to start first with the biology, um, and you know we haven't cracked the code on the biology of a lot of of a lot of tumor biology is just unknown and if it were easy um, we would have uh, you know we thought we were going to cure cancer when was the when was the was when was the uh, gauntlet thrown down in the US in the in the early 70s right or late 60s yeah and um, and and I think you know we're we've now since learned that the the um, tumor environment metastatic tumors etc it just is much more complicated than anyone ever conceived of, but we know so much more as well. So I think, you know, first of all, there's just the science and there's going to be uh, hopefully great advances. Really a, a significant limitation, though, I think, on the treatment side is just the off-target effects, is, is we know how to kill tumors, but we can't do it very safely. And so, you know, that's why you see over, you know, I, I think three of our companies are focused on better targeting of, uh, you know, cell killing vehicles because if we can increase cell killing in a targeted fashion and not, and not have to dose limiting toxicity, we could make some great progress. Um, on the on the diagnostic device side, the reason why I talked about payment so much is I think a real limitation is uh, gathering the data on a longitudinal level that justifies the business case. And you know, oncology is a long-term disease, and it's very expensive to, to run those trials to do the the economic studies and the outcome studies. And as a society, we're going to be limited for what we can afford to study and what we can afford to pay for until we see, you know, long-term trials. And so it, there's, got a, there's a lot of technologies and a lot of information that could come through the pipe, and we know in 10 years we're going to have a lot better diagnostics. We can't afford to pay for everything that even is sitting in front of us now. So. Um, I forgot what the original question was. But <laughs> I, you know, I think I'd agree that we are companion diagnostics. Compendium diagnostics, right. So we always, whenever I see a new diagnostic test, whether it's in oncology or another area, I sort of look at 
how it improves over what the current diagnostic tests are and which patient population it might really help out with and try and understand a little bit about how the test works. And some tests that are introduced are not that uh, groundbreaking that I adapt them right away. And sometimes you wait a little bit till you get some more clinical experience from other people or second publications or third publications. Um, but definitely the molecular biology continues to improve dramatically year after year. And so these tests are going to get better and better. And as they do, they'll get more useful and more useful. Um, I don't know if the FDA, you know, with, with some drugs, they do phase four post-marketing studies to see sort of real-world effectiveness and collect more data. And I don't think they do that with diagnostic studies, but um, yeah, they, do. they do. Okay, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I think it's just going to be an iterative process, and as we get more knowledge in molecular biology and, and engineering, we'll get better and better tests, and the an economic challenges are there, um, and we'll just have to find a way to overcome them uh, to help the patients. Uh, so it was mentioned that you use putting materials into people's bodies to use as uh, indicators for how much oxygen is there. There is in the tissue. Is there a way that you could put ox um, a material or a device into a cancerous tissue to cut off oxygen to supplied to the tissue or even blood flow supplied to the tissue in order to kill the cells? Uh, yeah, that's like that, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, that's... Um, that's the heart of trying to to uh, attack the the cells that are trying to proliferate to produce um, oxygen or blood flow to the tumor, and so there are inhibitors of that that type of uh, those t that type of activity in the surrounding tissue to the tumor. So that's a whole class of um, important drugs that people have developed over the past 20 years. Uh, I kind of get you. That that's a sort of chemical answer to that. I, I think you were trying to say, is there a physical way of doing that? Is that? Yeah. So um, yeah. So I, I think sur surgically or procedure-wise, that's what people, um, uh, oncologists or surgeons, can do. Um, when they try and surgically resect the tumor and the surrounding margins. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, so um, now I really got to hold, hold this close. Um, so uh, I think I answered the, the first one. That did everybody hear about the VEGF? And, and um, the second one is, uh, you know, can you do this physically? I think it really depends on the nature of the tumor. Um, I don't know, maybe a clinician would yeah, be better to answer so there's, that. So there's one area where, mm -hmm. uh, the only area that I know of, but maybe the clinician is, is, is it um, in certain types of tumors they're trying embolic materials. Oh, sure. So yeah. going in intravascularly and leaving behind either a, a, a glue or beads to embolize the area and so you knock off blood flow. Yeah. That's done in uh, liver cancer, for example, a very mm -hmm. common technique. Um, that, the reason that works so well in liver cancer is because it's confined to the liver. So mm -hmm. geographically, you can embolize the blood flow to it and starve the tumor of oxygen and glucose. But mm -hmm. when a tumor is in multiple places, then you have to hit those multiple places if you want to kill the cells down to normal levels. So that's where maybe a strategy like VEGF, uh, uh, antiangiogenic factors, can help you get a better cell kill when you deliver an agent or something. Well, first of all, I'd like to say I'm a 12-year-old, a 12-year cancer survivor. Yay. But between the beginning of treatment and the uh, end of, you know, now you you can go live your life. Um, the testing and the diagnostics and the medical research has improved that sometimes the data that has been collected on tumors um, hasn't been really evaluated for what its future uh, efficacy is because you don't know at the time that it's collected. So I was a false positive. Um, 
I'm wondering, in the light of current economics, to what extent do you see that research itself will be limited? Like, oh, well, we've got effective treatments. They work. They're cost effective. We don't want to spend any more money. Um, how do you see that that's going to affect the kind of research that institutions will be doing in the future? Um, there's taxation on companies that, that do medical devices. Uh, what kind of research and, and product development can they do? Or are we going to see a slowdown in the progress of medical research? That's a very broad-ranging, futuristic kind of question, but I, I do think that there's a lot of pressure on NIH funding right now with the um, debt crisis we're facing, and, um, and that will trickle, that will have an effect across the board of biomedical research um, until we kind of right-size our, our uh, inflows and outflows at a macro level. And so, yeah, I think we're going to see continuing cutback. I don't think it's going to be in response to we've cured cancer because that hasn't quite happened yet. And I think cancer will be one of the areas that continues to receive the most finance, financing and attention because also it's where patients are most desperate because of the lethality of the disease. And so, you know, it does get a lot of attention um, because of the patient advocacy component. Uh, I agree. <laughs> I guess uh, oh, microphone. If, if we're talking about reducing the funds for cancer research, I'd also say, you know, I hope not. Um, now would not be the time to, to do that in terms of the scientific progress that can be made and the lives that can be saved. <laughs> You know, I'd like to thank the panelists very much uh, for participating this evening, uh, Wendy Hutton and uh, Kevin Knopf and Michael Seema from Thanks. the Koch Institute. And on the behalf of the Koch Institute, I'd like to th thank the audience for attending. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the MIT Club of Northern California for organizing this event. And I would like to thank uh, Bristol Myers Squibb for hosting this event. They were our hosts this evening. so. We thank all of them.